Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program that is designed to offer you the opportunity to call in and share. But uh, the, uh, in my role as host of this program, I will endeavor to relate your call wherever possible to this most marvelous and incomprehensible book, the Bible. I say incomprehensible because it is so... Uh, so it is. It is has so much information on uh, in it, and it's hidden so deeply at times that uh, we can spend more than a whole lifetime studying it, and we still uh, have not plumbed the full depths of the riches of the Word of God. Of course, as we have been working in the Scriptures for a long time, and and talking about the Bible together for right on this program for more than 40 years. We have learned a lot from the Bible, and oh my, how important it is, because everything in it relates right back to you and to me, because the, we are the ones to whom God has provided the Bible. Now, we have a listener in China who asks a, a very interesting question. Uh, the question is, there are some artists who make statues for people to worship. Uh, in other words, the idols are made, and uh, like Buddhas uh, uh, and so on. And uh, how? Uh, the question is, how are we to treat them? If we're a true believer and we know they are busy uh, uh, building the dominion of Satan because all of this idol worship has to do with the kingdom of Satan, how are we to treat them? Well, we're to treat them the way we treat anyone who is has not come to the truth of the Bible. We're to look upon them as uh, people who we are to love we are to love our enemies. Now, why are they the enemy? Anyone who is not saved is an enemy because uh, there is enmity, terrible enmity between the kingdom of Christ, which we have entered into when we become saved, and the dominion of Satan. Oh, the enmity comes uh, because Satan hates the kingdom of Christ. He wants to destroy it. It's his, his declared a desire to destroy the kingdom of Satan, and therefore he has become the sworn enemy of the kingdom of Christ. Now, ultimately, of course, uh, Christ is out to destroy the kingdom of Satan. But in the meanwhile, until we come to that time when when the kingdom of Satan will be thoroughly destroyed, and that will be the last day of the history of the world, when Christ appears as the judge of all the earth, until that time, we are not to sit in judgment over the unsaved of the world, no matter how much sin we see in their life, no matter how we see them openly serving Satan in one way or another. We are to love them and, in, and, and pray for them and try to share the gospel with them, uh, hoping that at least some of them, too, might uh, have their spiritual eyes opened by God and become a child of God. And so under no circumstance are we to treat them with, with dis, as if they are enemies. We are simply to uh, try to look for opportunities to share the truth with them. And of course, uh, ordinarily, they will not want to hear the truth at all. And then at least we can, if we have a... The ones that we truly have a concern for, because we can't pray for everybody in the whole world, except in a very general way, but we can pray for this one specifically and that one specifically. Oh, God, could it be that you might have mercy, that you might have mercy? Oh, Lord, we implore you, we beseech of thee, could it be that you're, you might have mercy upon this one and that one, uh, that their hearts, too, might become open? That is the attitude that to which, uh, with which we are to look upon 
anyone who still gives plenty of evidence that they have no regard for the truth of the Bible. Well, thank you, China, for that. It's a very practical question because we all live in a very wicked world and we're surrounded by people who are in the, under the dominion of Satan. And, and we're not to walk around with a chip on our shoulder waiting to pick an argument or a fight. We are to very humbly look upon them as people who are to be pitied, people that we earnestly hope God might have mercy upon. But shall we now, thank you, China, for that question, and now shall we go to our first caller on our telephones tonight. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, how are you doing, Brother Camping? Very well, thank you. Um, can you help me understand who Gabriel was? Well, in the Bible, Gabriel is a heavenly being of some kind. And, uh, and when we search it out, there are many, many theologians who conclude that Gabriel was an angel. And uh, because he is called uh, a messenger, the word angel is really the word messenger. Now, a messenger can be an angel. They were messengers at various times. A messenger can be a human being. Uh, anyone who has bringing a message, when we bring the message of the gospel, in that sense, uh, we're, we're a messenger just as, in, uh, as the word applies to an angel. But God himself is also a messenger. However, when we look at all the references to Gabriel, we find that uh, we can be quite certain that Gabriel Gabriel is really God himself, just like uh, 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 he is, uh, because his name, because his name, Gabriel, means God-man, God-man, or man-God, and that applies to Christ. He is the Son of God, he is the Son of Man, and also as we uh, see how he is spoken about from time to time, it all fits together when we recognize that he was, uh, that he was, uh, 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 that, that uh, Gabriel is really uh, Christ himself. Uh, just as we read about the uh, another uh, individual who most theologians think was an angel, and uh, that was uh, that was Michael, Michael. But again, uh, who is also called an archangel in the Bible, and that's a wrong translation. It should be chief messenger. Michael also is a reference to Christ, and the word Michael means who is like God or who is God and uh, so both Michael and Gabriel the only two individuals that apparently look like they are angels and are given a name uh, there are no other uh, uh, angels in the Bible that are given any kind of a name and yet here are two that apparently are angels and yet when we sort it all out very carefully we can be quite sure that they're a reference to Christ himself. Okay, happy holidays, and thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Brother Camping. Yes. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, my question, I called before a couple months ago about the book of Jonah. Now, Two books later, I mean, they were all saved in Nineveh, I understand that, but two books later in Nahum, how much time elapsed, because then they all went to hell? Well, you have to remember, first of all, uh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, but it no, and by no means included all of Assyria. It, uh, it was just uh, a, a small portion of the whole nation of Assyria. Uh, it, it, it was a large city in that day. It had at least 120,000 inhabitants, according to the book of Jonah. Secondly, there's nothing in the Bible that says that any of the children of the people living at that time were, uh, uh, did become saved. God is using that particular city at that particular instant in time 
as a portrait, as a picture of what God's salvation plan is. And it was absolutely a miracle what did happen that that the people uh, uh, that lived at that time did become saved because we know we know that from the New Testament that they did become saved. But that did not mean that the next generation that would have followed in, in 20 or 30 or 40 years, that they were just as wicked as they were before. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is, if how is it someone who is dead, as you say, pray, or why would they pray to be saved if they're dead? Why would they say if th- that they're saved if they are not? No, no, no. Why would you tell people to pray for mercy on their soul, but if they are dead in sin, they can't do that? So what is the point of telling somebody to pray for mercy if they wouldn't do that if they were dead in sin, based on your illustration of Lazarus? In other words, are you saying, how can it be that someone can pray for God's mercy if they're spiritually dead in sin? Right, because they, 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 they would not pray for mercy because... I'm sorry, we have a bad phone line of some kind, or at least I'm having okay. difficulty following you. Is that you. better? Yeah, that sounds better. I'm sorry. My question is, I mean, if they're dead, like Lazarus, it's impossible for them to pray for mercy. Oh, well, now, we have to remember that God gives us uh, lots of information about salvation. Now, when he's talking about the raising of Lazarus, he is giving us a perspective of how uh, impossible it is for anyone to become saved of themselves. Uh, okay. Because we are spiritually dead and God has to do all the work. However, I, okay, however, as we go continue to read from the Bible, we do find that even in the life of the spiritually dead person, he still has a conscience. Uh, for example, we read in uh, John chapter 8, Now, here God is talking about these wicked Pharisees who are trying to trap Jesus. I mean, they are emissaries of Satan. And uh, they have taken this uh, uh, woman, they have caught this woman in adultery, and now they're going to use her to try to trap Jesus into uh, making some kind of a statement that will will cause Jesus to sin. And then Jesus knelt on the ground, and he, we read in verse 8, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, who is Jesus? He's eternal God. He is the lawgiver. He writes the law. When he's writing on the ground, he's writing out some aspect of the law of God. We don't know what he wrote. But these Pharisees are witnessing this. And then... We read in verse 9, their reaction to this. Now, they're spiritually dead. They're as spiritually dead as Lazarus was physically dead when he was a stinking corpse. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, convicted by their own conscience. All right, now... Uh, what What is that teaching? We go to Romans chapter 2, where God gives a commentary on this. In Romans chapter 2, God says in verse 14, for the Gentiles or the heathen, in this context it's talking about anybody who does not, uh, come, does not want to be under the law of God, who have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness. In other words, every unsaved person, even though spiritually he is dead, he is a stinking corpse insofar as having any ability to become saved, yet he still has a conscience. He's aware to some degree of right and wrong. And and 
Uh, that's a, that's another nuance, another aspect that we have to keep in mind that mankind can to some degree obey the law of God even though they do it very imperfectly uh, they do it because their own conscience uh, will will convict them uh, and I don't understand it I mean again to me I look at it as a contradiction that if they are dead and they were you know and you know none are righteous they're all wicked right so if you're wicked you can't Pray to God because you're dead. Well, but so uh, excuse me. Excuse, and secondly, there's another point. There's another point. We read, for example, the wicked Balaam. Now, you remember him? He's, he's recorded for us in Numbers 22. Now, bear in mind, all I'm doing is comparing Scripture with Scripture. We're, in, we're commanded to do that. We don't, we don't make a full set of doctrines based on... Uh, a few verses over here. We have to look into this, our conclusions uh, in the light of the whole Bible. All right, now here's wicked Balaam. Here's wicked Balaam. And the Bible assures us that he was wicked and never did become saved. He's even referred to again in the New Testament, in the book of Jude, uh, as being a, a, a wicked, very wicked person. Yet, yet, out of his mouth came the most beautiful words of praise. Read uh, for Israel and for God's work. As you uh, please read Numbers 22 and Numbers 23, and and he was obedient to the command of God to a certain degree. How did that happen? You see, God can do he can can work in the heart of an unsaved person, even though he never intends to save that person. God can work in that person's heart. Not only that person has a uh, that, but that person has a conscience, whereby he, to some degree, can can do the will of God. But under no circumstance is what he is doing going to contribute one smidgen, one iota toward his salvation. That is a different matter. That's a different matter. In other words, it's one thing to be able to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, somehow do a little bit of God's will, and it's another thing to be so spiritually dead that there's no possibility that I that anyone can do anything to further their salvation. The fact that Balaam, who was a very wicked person, did the will of God and 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 uh, said such beautiful statements about Israel that did not con uh, further his him towards salvation in the slightest. The fact that these Pharisees uh, were convicted in their conscience and recognized that that they were guilty, uh, that did not further their, the possibility of salvation for them at all. Because, the, uh, because by nature we're all as dead in our sins, we're a spiritual corpse, we're like dry bones. And it requires the entire, the whole transaction from that, from that level of the fact that we're absolutely spiritual dead. God has to do all the work to save us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, my name is Peter. And I'm wondering why. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, there is a place where Abraham and his wife agree that wherever they go, Sarah would say that Abraham is his brother, is her brother. And uh, they come to a point where they meet Abimelech, and when Abimelech approaches them, she says that Abraham is her brother. Now, God passes judgment on Abimelech uh, when he takes Sarah into his into his household but has not come near her according to the Bible now how come 
God does not seem to punish Abraham and Sarah for lying, that he punishes Abimelech for uh, thinking to take Sarah as a wife, even though he really doesn't uh, get to the point of sleeping with her. You know, it's very significant that God holds up Abraham as an outstanding illustration of a saved person. He is called, in fact, he is called the father of all believers. In, 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 if we are, if we are uh, of Christ, we are Abraham's seed, because uh, 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 the line of Christ came through Abraham, and we see him in his. Uh, it, in the height of his obedience, as he leaves his uh, homeland of Ur of the Chaldees and goes to a land, a uh, strange land, uh, just he and his little tiny family uh, go to a strange land, leaving all of his family because God commands him to do so. In other words, and then when God commands him to uh, to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son, uh, my, he uh, the next morning he g goes right ahead and makes all the uh, provision and and leaves his tent and uh, begins to journey three days journey to sacrifice his son Isaac right in other words in one way we see Abraham as a sterling and marvelous example of what a true believer is but on the other hand we also see that he like any true believer uh, still was not perfect in himself. He was perfect because, in the sense that Christ had paid for all of his sins, as he has done for every saved person, and therefore, uh, from God's vantage point, he is perfect. But insofar as actually the way he lived, he too uh, uh, had times when his faith was weak and when he wasn't uh, living quite the way he should. For example, uh, when he took when he uh, took Hagar temporarily as his wife in order to try to fulfill God's promise that that uh, you you would be the father of a multitude of nations. That was completely wrong to do. He was trusting in himself, not in Christ. Likewise, when there was a famine in the land, and he goes to uh, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, and he and uh, he's telling a, a, a truth because Sarah was his half sister. Uh, she, uh, there was a truth in that, but in another sense, it was a lie because uh, he she was also her uh, his wife, and he should have come come forward and said that. And so God is simply illustrating to us, as well as he's teaching other principles, of course, in, in these uh, statements that we find in the Bible. But uh, one of the big principles is, is that uh, uh, here is one of the great men, the, the uh, outstanding examples of what a Christian ought to be. Think about David, for example, an outstanding example of what a true child ought to be. And yet God spreads out on the, on the pages of the Bible uh, the, the gory details of how he committed adultery with Bathsheba and even had her husband murdered. And and uh, how can that be? How can that be? Uh, but it goes, it is a lesson to us. Just because you think you are a child of God, you're convinced that Christ is your Savior, uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to fall if you take your eyes off Christ. And, and, uh, and that also is great encouragement to us that if we do fall, it doesn't mean that God has rejected us. We, uh, we can still go to Him, uh, and, and He will, uh, uh, strengthen us again. Yet what it seems to show to some is that if, if you're godly, um, God sometimes might overlook your fault. Whereas if you are ungodly as Abimelech was, God may be quick to punish. Yeah. Oh, excuse and, me, God didn't punish Abimelech. God didn't punish him. He, well, he, in he a sense, he did. He closed all the wives. His whole household wife. was struck, and yes. the women were barren. Yes, yes, there was. And uh, but, but, if you see, at the end of, at the end of the, that experience, 
God does ask Abraham to, br- to pray for Abimelech so that the wombs of the women are opened yeah, well, and but, everyone but, is able to bear ch- children. But you got to remember that uh, God is sh- sh- make, giving one spiritual lesson in Abimelech, another spiritual lesson in the conduct of Abraham and Sarah, and, and look, at da- look at David. David rebe- uh, committed sin. Uh, uh, well, let's look at Solomon. Uh, he was really a child of God, and he committed the sin of multiplying wives, and it finally uh, uh, got so bad that he even uh, began to, uh, uh, in his old age, began to, uh, to some degree, worship their gods. And the punishment was enormous, because here is Solomon, who had been blessed and blessed, and who ruled over the richest and most wonderful kingdom that ever existed to that day, and God took all of that away from his son, from his uh, from his uh, dynasty. When his son Rehoboam came to the throne, it ended up with Rehoboam only reigning over two tribes instead of twelve tribes. Talk about punishment. Look at David. David, who was uh, uh, blessed and blessed, and yet he had his weaknesses, and the consequence is, we look at him in his old age, when he should have been, uh, oh, just a, 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 a time of, of uh, security, a time of happiness, uh, because look how God has blessed, and instead his son Absalom has, uh, has threatened, and, and to such a degree, that David is forced to flee like a refugee from Jerusalem. Uh, uh, terrible, terrible. Here is this old king who has been blessed of God so many ways and had been such a powerful ruler over Israel, and he's forced to flee like a common refugee from Jerusalem. In other words, uh, every situation uh, has its own lessons to tell us. So we don't have to think that that just because Abraham in that particular instance of of, uh, of Abimelech, that uh, there, because there was no apparent punishment, that that was characteristic of the way God deals with true believers. But thank you for calling and sharing. Now, before we take our next call, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to uh, pause for this message. Before we continue with the Open Forum program, we have a couple more uh, letters from our mission team in uh, in uh, Managua, Nicaragua, where we have about 27 individuals who are busily, busily uh, representing uh, the gospel. I was going to say representing Family Radio. No, 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 no. They're representing the Lord Jesus Christ by sharing the gospel with them through uh, Family Radio's uh, tract, which is basically uh, uh, the Bible itself, be a portion of the Bible, because it has more than 40 verses directly quoted from the Bible, and that is the Living Word. And uh, and uh, if this is from what is ha- what happened last Tuesday, day before yesterday. Today we received 100,000 more. Does God love you? Tracks to complete our order of. 350,000, that's more than one-third of a million tracts, and 400 more Spanish Bibles for a total total of 1,400. Incidentally, whenever Family Radio uh, sends out a Bible, it is never just the New Testament because that is a portion of the Bible, but uh, the, uh, if we're going to share the Bible with someone, we want to make sure that we're giving the whole Bible, because all Scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine that is teaching and correction and so on. Now, three teams, going back to our letter, three teams visited several poor residential areas called barrios on the outskirts of Managua and distributed tracts, Bibles, and study materials to the very receptive and appreciative people there. 
on the dusty streets and in the small market areas. The barrios typically have unpaved streets, no electricity, no running water, open sewers, and are strewn with all manner of junk. They are considered to be dangerous, high-crime areas. But, by the grace of God, our people had no problems bringing the true gospel of Christ to these very needy people. Who is a needy? In the whole world, everybody needs the gospel. Another team went to a suburb area called Tipitapa, uh, and had a very successful day of distribution in a busy central market area that was a beehive of vehicle and pedestrian activity. The regular indoor-outdoor markets here are typically a hodgepodge of all manners of stalls and booths selling literally everything from soup to nuts, including the kitchen sink. There are also many no-frills eateries that serve the thousands of poor and middle-class people. Most of these people are the people in this poor country travel economically on the many local and inner-city buses. There is usually a bus terminal near the markets, and they are excellent places to distribute tracks. Several of our people... Uh, board the buses on the, at the front, give a track to the driver, walk down the aisle, handing tracks to the s- seated passengers, and exit through the back door. The team that went to the large manufacturing area yesterday morning decided to go back this evening and catch the workers as they left work. There were thousands of people leaving at slower pace than when they arrived, and it was easier to get tracks into the hands of most of the workers. Then on Wednesday, that was yesterday, uh, we read, Our distribution work progressed at a rapid pace again today with excellent acceptance of the tracks everywhere. Two teams visited the residential areas called barrios where the poorest of the poor live. One was next to a large trash dump where men, women, and children scavenge scavenge for anything of value. The area was smoky and dirty. But the people were very gracious and appreciative for the tracts, Bibles, and materials given them. Another barrio was on the side of a mountain. The team went up the mountain by taxi until the road became impassable and then hiked the narrow, dusty trails from door to door down the mountain. Many people keep barking dogs to protect their properties from intruders. But none of our people were harmed or bothered in any way as they delivered the precious gospel of Christ. Other teams visited many large markets, and one team went to the suburb of Tipitapa again today because of the large numbers of people that throng that area. They covered more difficult areas than the team did yesterday, and the distribution and acceptance rate remained very high. We have been allowed to enter and give out tracts to lines of people in government offices all over the city with no problem whatsoever. We just give each guard a tract, ask if it's okay to distribute inside, and hand the tracts to all the people inside. One member of our group was allowed free access into a motor vehicle licensing office that was packed with hundreds of people, and practically everyone took a track. We received an order for 200 more Bibles, for a total of 1,600 so far. The demand for Bibles is high, and it is disappointing for many people and us as well when we run out. 
The weather has been hot and humid, but we have had no rain to disrupt our work since we have been here. We have experienced very little opposition to our work here, and our group members are staying healthy and in good spirits as we go forth with the sword of the Spirit. We are praying that God will reap a great harvest of souls for His kingdom in Nicaragua and in this part of the world. And then this letter closes with the uh, verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Christian Love, the Family Radio Mission Group in Nicaragua. Well, again, a very, very uh, uh, encouraging report. A very encouraging report. Uh, it just uh, uh, seems to identify so ne- clearly with God's statement of Revelation 7, verse 9. A great multitude, which no man can number, will become saved right in our day. Because... Uh, uh, it has to begin with first hearing the word of God. And these dear people, as they gladly accept these tracks, will also uh, learn from these tracks where they can follow up. Uh, most of them are way too poor to own a, uh, be able to have access to Internet. But um, they, uh, c- if they can somehow uh, get uh, under the hearing of a shortwave radio or even in that particular area we are on some of the local stations uh, they uh, if they are uh, able to do this and God can make provision for that uh, they too can have the follow up and those of course who read the tracks carefully and uh, those who receive the Bibles they have the word of God right in their hand what could be better than that Well, let's pray for them and pray for our mission team. But right now, let's go back to our program and take our next caller, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Um, Yes, I have two questions, and I feel like they kind of relate to each other. Um, I have a situation where a missionary keeps coming to my house, and she's said that she's gone from one denomination. I'm sorry. Your voice is falling away. Could you speak right into your phone, please? Yes, sir. Um... My question is, is that I have a missionary that keeps coming to my house, even though I told her I did not believe in her denomination, but she keeps coming back. And I think that she's interested in the feedback that I give her. Um, my question is, um, how should I address the situation? What, what does the Bible say I should do about the situation on how to handle the, that? And the other question is, is how can I show her in the scriptures that um, Christ's name is also faithful. Well, first of all, if if you know this person is coming with another gospel, now remember, this person is a missionary of a gospel, a gospel, and their only true gospel is the whole Bible. And we know that uh, any missionary who's been trained in the church, unless... Uh, unless God has already opened their spiritual eyes and they clearly understand that we're at the end of the church age and that God is not blessing uh, through the churches any longer, they're still coming with another gospel. And God instructs us in uh, Second John, the second epistle of John, uh, right near just before Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, that if someone comes with another gospel, give them no greeting. Now, this person is not coming to your house for you to teach her, from what you have said at any rate. She is coming there to teach you, and that is not what you should have happen. Then you would be going contrary to the Word of God. Okay. And um, where can I see in the Scripture that Christ... I'm sorry, your voice falls away. Please uh, speak right into your phone. How can I see in the scripture that Christ's name is faithful? Oh, that God, Christ's name is faithful? That's in Revelation. Oh, boy. Where is that? Revelation. Um, uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful 
and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, right here, our God has given the Lord Jesus three names, faithful, true, Word of God, but also indicating he has a name which no man can know, because each name is describing something about who God is, and and no one can know altogether who God is. And, and so here, this is where we know his name is faithful, as well as uh, uh, Jesus, as well as Christ, as well as uh, uh, Emmanuel, and so on. But thank okay. you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, I have a sort of a two-part question. It's kind of quick, and I'll take the answer over to the air uh, to give others a chance to call in. Uh, I agree with you about the church age. My wife and I had experienced that ourselves personally many years ago. Uh, however, uh, do you believe that it's possible there are some congregations in this country or in the world that are still teaching the truth like family radio and perhaps even use family radio and your shows as a framework for their perhaps statements of faith, even though they may be few and far between? And if so, uh, what about the counsel that you give over the air for everybody to come out of the churches uh, because the truth can't be found anywhere, which sort of implies there are no congregations that may actually be using family radio itself uh, as a basis for what they teach. Well, so if you address that, I'll go ahead and take it over the air. Thank you. Yeah, well, you see, I, I, if, they were, if they were following what we teach, as we are convicted that we're trying to follow only the Bible and checking out constantly to make sure that we aren't missing something and, and ready to make correction instantly if we can be shown from the Bible that we are teaching something not, not quite accurately. But the Bible teaches that God is finished with the churches and commands those within the churches to come out, to leave the churches. Like we read in Matthew 24, verse 15, when the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's a command. And so if there were such a church in the world, and there may be, it would uh, quickly cease to be a church. Uh, the pastor would have to say, oh, I've come to truth. I can't be a pastor any longer. We cannot have elders and deacons any longer. We cannot have a church membership. We have to cease being a church. Uh, we can't be part of this denomination that we were a part of any longer, and they would not be a church. In other words, as long as they're insisting they're still a church or a part of a denomination, they're still in rebellion against God. They're showing that indeed they don't follow the whole Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Yes, for the camping, can you shed some light on Mark thirteen seventeen? Mark 13, verse 17. Yes. Let's look at that. Mark... 13, verse 17, But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's talking about this time of great tribulation. And, uh, and uh, here we have parent after parent with their little family, and they trustingly go to their uh, congregational worship services and to their Sunday schools, uh, because they, oh, they want their children to be saved also. And actually, <coughs> excuse me, actually, they're setting their children up for 
Judgment Day and hell because there is no possibility that that as they faithfully attend their church services and their Sunday schools, that the Holy Spirit is going to work to save anyone. The Holy Spirit has abandoned the churches. It's under the rule of Satan. Now, God uh, picked pick this up in a, in a very interesting and, and dramatic way in, in the book of Lamentations, because the book of Lamentations is a lament uh, that is lamenting the death of the last good King Josiah, who really, which ushered in the great tribulation that was a type or picture of our present uh, tribulation. And we read in uh, where God uses this language to say essentially the same thing. Uh, we read in verse 11. This is God speaking in verse, uh, in Lamentations chapter 2. Mine eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people. This is the, the woe and the anguish and the sorrow that the believers in Christ has for the fact that God's judgment is upon the churches. And then it goes on. Because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city, they say to their mothers, where is corn and wine? That's a figure of the speech. Uh, speech. Where is the true gospel? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom. Now, in 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 this historical uh, example, uh, they were actually physically killed uh, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar had sent his armies to destroy Jerusalem, but that was spiritually pointing to the fact that that's the condition spiritually in the churches today, that those who remain there are simply setting themselves up for uh, their turn at the judgment throne of God where they will be found guilty. And to put their children there, uh, 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 really uh, thinking that they are safe when actually they have placed them in the most dangerous place possible because God's wrath, God's judgment process is working already as he's preparing those in the churches for their turn at the judgment throne. So, Brother Campbell D., uh, where it says, and to them that give suck in those days, is that women that conceive children that they shouldn't be bringing them into this world? No, it is talking about those who remain in the churches right. and, and will not obey God's rule. You see, it's bad enough that here's an adult who says, no. I believe this church is still faithful, and I don't agree with these people who teach that the church age is over. I believe we have a faithful pastor, and I'm going to stay here. Well, okay, they're speaking for themselves, and they are setting themselves up for the wrath of God. But when they rule over their children and bring their children there who, uh, who are just trusting their parents, uh, then and they're setting them also up for Judgment Day because there is no salvation there, none whatsoever. It, it is the most piteous and terrible situation imaginable. Uh, and and uh, if, if they got out, then at least their children, uh, they uh, hopefully would be uh, listening more carefully to find out where is then the true gospel. And because outside of the churches, Families, uh, uh, children, our parents who who hear the true gospel, and uh, then they in turn can encourage their children to be listening to the word of God and praying for their children. And it's outside of the churches, the Holy Spirit is working to save a great multitude which no man can number. Thank you very much, Brother Kim. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, could you tell me, uh, what, uh, it doesn't tell them that I can see in the Bible, the parents of Cain's wife or where the people came from after Adam and Eve had, had. Well, we know 
Uh, we know that Adam and Eve were our first parents, and we read in Genesis 3 that Eve is the mother of all living. And now they bore children. And we read in Genesis chapter 5 that they, uh, Adam bore, uh, after Seth was born, who was the third son after Cain and Abel, uh, that, he, uh, that he bore sons and daughters. And so at the beginning, uh, brothers would have married sisters. And then in turn, as they, uh, and they, at that time, people lived a long time, like as many as over 900 years. And later on, they would have married maybe a cousin. Uh, uh, and, and so on, and, and slowly on the whole human race began to develop. But it all got absolutely started out with Adam and Eve, like we read in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all died. He, we all started out in Adam. Well, thank you so much. You helped me a lot. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camp. I have to turn down my radio. I didn't expect to go on the air right away. Hear you. Uh, thank you. Um, in reviewing uh, Revelations 13, chapter 13, yes, I came across um, Revelation uh, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10, If Correct. any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, what is your question? Well, the question is, I notice in chapter 13, at first uh, God delves in considerable depth on the topic of the beast that came out from the sea. Um, you know, the famous beast with the Mark 666. And uh, subsequent to uh, verse 10, he talks about the second beast that came up from the land. Uh, both of these portions of chapter 13 are very, very ominous. And right here in the middle, it seems as though there's this change of pace where, you know, it's almost like a, like a, a statement in... I can't even characterize it. It's it's just a completely different kind of segue. And I was wondering uh, if you understood what I'm talking about. Well, sure. You see, the fact is, in the first part of the Revelation, the whole chapter, the whole chapter is talking about Satan's rule within the congregations. When when God was finished with the local congregations, Christ freed Satan from uh, from uh, 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 hell temporarily so that he could utilize Satan. This is God's action. He actually employed Satan to rule within the local congregations. And so he pictures him as a beast that comes out of the sea with great power. Notice verse 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That is the first thing that he did was silence all the true believers in the churches. As we read in uh, in Revelation 11 where it says that two witnesses were killed and their bodies lie, lay in the city uh, where their Lord was crucified, that was called Sodom and Egypt, and uh, in indicating that they were silenced, they could not. Uh, the true gospel could not be there anymore. Satan ruled; uh, he overcame them, and power was given him, uh, and that that rule were extended far beyond even the local congregations. He uh, was given a new lease on life, insofar as as while he's uh, always been. Uh, 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 around to some degree, uh, seeding the churches with with uh, with tares, uh, people who looked like they were true believers but were not. Uh, but now he has a total rule in the churches. And while he was active in the world to some degree, now he has far more. Uh, far more r uh, rule, and that's why we see an enormous increase in sin in the world, as it's, it's never been like it is today. The the uh, the s s sin, the wickedness that we see everywhere, and and so he has power. 
was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And, and, it, and all they that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of, of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, anyone who is not one of the elect of God will uh, serve him spiritually in one way or another. Now, there, God, again, in verse, then in verse 9, <coughs> God makes a, 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 a statement. If anyone has ears, let him hear. Now, in other words, he's talking to those who are listening, and the only ones who have ears to hear are the ones who God has given spiritual ears to hear. Uh, listen carefully to what I am saying, because otherwise you are going to be all confused by what's happening. How can it be that uh, that Satan is ruling over the saints and doing these dreadful things in chapter 7? How can it be that uh, what's going to follow is going to take place? But Listen carefully. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. That is, uh, that's not the end. There's, there, there's finally an end when Satan is going to be destroyed. But we're not quite there yet. Uh, he's saying, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And Satan will, will, will finally be vanquished on the last day. But then in verse 11, and we'll hold on, I'll be right back with you. We've had a caller who has asked a question about Revelation 13, and we're just kind of summarizing this chapter. And we find that the whole chapter is talking about what is occurring today, right in the, uh, in the world today. And the first eight verses are discussing the fact that Satan has been loosed, and he has been given an authority in the world and in the churches that he's never had before to the degree that he has it today. Then in verse uh, 9, God uh, is saying, now, you'll only understand this if you have been given ears to ear. And then in verse 10, God is indicating in the view of this terrible situation, bear in mind, eventually, Satan, uh, who is, who is uh, uh, leading uh, uh, people into captivity, uh, that he will also be destroyed because there is a judgment day coming. Now from verse 11 to verse 18, the rest of the chapter, God goes back to the original theme, except now he is particularly dealing with Satan's activity within the local congregations. Not in the whole world, but just in the, the local congregations, as he now pictures Satan coming as a dragon with uh, with uh, uh, two horns, who, who uh, or uh, like a beast, with two horns like a lamb, that is appearing like the Lord Jesus, and yet he spake as a dragon, and uh, and then from then on it describes in in uh, in parabolic language, in metaphorical language, how Satan ha is presently operating in the churches of our day. And so it all hangs together uh, very, very well. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Hello, Brother Campy. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of verses I'd like to look at. This one of them's in Romans uh, 10, verse 9. I'm sorry. Could you speak right into your phone? Your voice fell away. Romans, yeah, ten verse nine. Say it once more. Speak right into your phone. Romans ten verse nine. Ten verse nine. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Romans ten verse nine. Let's look at that. Romans ten verse nine. There we read, If thou shalt confess that with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? What is, the, what is your question? I want to know if we could compare that with... Well, how do we understand this? You know, a key statement in this verse that we normally pass over and don't really look at fully enough... It says here, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, in thine heart. 
Now, what is the biblical decoration of the heart of unsaved men? We read in Jeremiah chapter 17, The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart of man is desperately wicked. We read in Mark, I think chapter 7, some place where it says, Out of the heart of man comes adulteries and murders and all kinds of ugly things. In other words, the man in his heart is dead in trespasses and sins. So how in the world can you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead? Now you can believe him in your in uh, in uh, uh, as you think about this and so on you can acknowledge that you can i uh, think you are believing that in your heart but how can you if your heart is desperately wicked now the answer comes uh, in uh, in this beautiful statement in the old testament which we go back to again and again because it is so powerful and yet it is only saying what is found in many other places in the bible where where God says in Ezekiel 36, where he says, uh, uh, I will do this, uh, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you. A new heart, brand new heart. And a new spirit will I put within you. And in verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and cause you to, and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments that is my laws and do them. And if we've been given a new heart by God, then yes, then we can believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. But if he hasn't given us a new heart, we can't believe that he has raised up uh, him from the dead because our heart is desperately wicked we can think we can uh, argue with ourselves oh but I do believe with all my heart well you can't unless God gives you a new heart but if you've been given a new heart it means you are a child of God you have become saved okay uh, brother Camping when we look at uh, Acts uh, 13 verse 48 uh, what, what, what is the uh, what is the uh, reference? It's Acts thirteen verse forty eight. Oh uh, yes, Acts thirteen verse forty eight. Let's look at that. Acts thirteen verse forty eight. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life. Believed. That is, those who were ordained means God. they were elected of God. And at this moment, God gave them a new heart, which is what salvation is, so that they might believe, that they might obey, because that is a command of God. That's a work that we have to do to believe on him. But we can only do that kind of work. We can only believe on him and love him and, and have faith in him and so on if we have become saved. Yeah, those two verses really go good together. They go perfectly well together. Well, okay, Brother Camping, good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, my. We had a problem with our phone line somehow. I wonder what happened. All right. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead with your call. Yes, I was going to refer to that Acts verse that the previous caller mentioned. Which verse? It was Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 48. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I would have to refer to the next verse after that, verse and 49. The and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. 
Mm-hmm. And when the word went to all the people, wouldn't they have been able to have a chance to accept that? Uh, in, since in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of God, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Wouldn't they all have had a chance for eternal life to believing? Well, everybody had a chance, but the fact is, nobody of themselves, neither I nor anybody in the whole human race of themselves, want to trust God on God's terms, because all of us, by nature, have a wicked heart, as we read in Jeremiah 17. The heart of man is desperately wicked. And we, yes, there's also another verse in Romans that states um, uh, about that with, um, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. You're correct. They're all gone out of the way and together become unprofitable. All right, so... So therefore, while we all, the whole human race has a chance, the fact is nobody will become saved unless God himself muscled himself in by mm -hmm. choosing them from before the foundation of the world to become saved and then followed up with this by paying for their sins and actually finally giving them a, giving all of us whom he had chosen to become saved a new heart, a new spirit, so that now we have become a child of God, and now we do begin to do the will of God. We begin to be obedient to him in a way that is pleasing to God. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first one concerns Pika, I guess is his name, and Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 6. Let's look at that. Second Chronicles 28, verse 6. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Uh, reading, as I was reading other verses about Pekah, um, I noticed that he, he began to reign, uh, I believe, in the 52nd year of Uzziah. And I was wondering if you've had a chance to study Pekah, because he seems to be somehow identified with uh, Satan's assault on the church. Oh, uh, that may be. I don't know. I have never worked through these kings from that vantage point. I have worked through these kings exceedingly carefully in order to uh, get the, uh, the timeline corrected, or that is, uh, uh, and I have found that every statement about when they began to reign or how old they began to reign or or how long they began to reign, or they did reign, or whatever, all fits perfectly. We can we can work through that with great uh, with great confidence uh, that uh, that every sentence is trustworthy. And we do know that basically all the kings of Judah uh, of Israel rather, and there were uh, twenty kings, twenty kings that ruled over. Uh, 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 the uh, at various times uh, consisting of quite a number of different di dynasties uh, that reigned in Israel, and that we don't read of one of them that was a picture of Christ. They were all really pictures of Satan. We can at least say that in general terms. Um, what do you, who do you think Uz Uzziah represents in his 52nd year? You know, he tried to come into the temple and offer incense and he came under judgment for that. Do you think he somehow is related to the end of the church age? I don't know. I have never, I haven't really looked at that, uh, to examine that carefully enough, so I would have to be speculating, and I'd rather not do that. Okay. My second question concerns the timeline of the Sunday Sabbath. Um, we know that the Saturday Sabbath, um, it began Friday evening at sundown and ended on Saturday evening, I believe, at sundown, and therefore, from a Jewish calendar perspective, uh, we, we might be able to conclude that the Sunday Sabbath could also begin at sundown Saturday and end at sundown Sunday. 
Um, so do you think there's anything improper about a true believer observing the, the Sunday Sabbath from sundown Saturday to sundown Sunday? I think that that is incorrect because uh, we find that uh, there are two references uh, to the Sunday Sabbath. Uh, one is that Christ arose early in the morning, and that means that the Sunday Sabbath began early in the morning on uh, uh, or uh, uh, in all likely began early in the morning on Sunday. And in uh, the book of Acts, we read about Paul. Uh, this, again, is the word of God. God is giving this instruction there that it was on a Sunday that Paul was preaching until midnight. And so that would indicate that, and, and in the Bible, it is true that in the Old Testament, God did uh, make the day go from sundown to sundown. We particularly we know that because of what we read about the Day of Atonement, which was on the tenth day of the seventh month. That that's the, really the only verse where we have specific uh, instruction about that. But that really carried uh, would have to carry th- through all of the days of the month in order to have any kind of consistency. But when we come to the New Testament, we also know that God used the Roman calendar, uh, which or the Roman time, which was from midnight to midnight. And based upon uh, the statement in the book of Acts about Paul preaching till midnight, I would have to say that, that it's now a new... We're not related. The Sunday Sabbath is not related to the Seventh-day Sabbath. It is a new era. It is the era of the church age, and, and Sunday is from, from midnight to midnight, I do believe. Yeah, I was, looking at, I was looking at Acts 20, and I did notice that there's a reference to Paul preaching until midnight. Yes. But when you get down to verse 11, it goes on to say that he continued to break bread until day, day, the break of day. Yes, and also, but, furthermore, we know that we're not quite sh- we're not quite sure when Christ rose from the dead because he actually rose before well, before you know, uh, morning time. You know, I, actually, this is not a, a very you know, it can be a serious question, depending on why we are asking the question. Now, <laughs> there are lots of people that want to worship on Saturday because. Sunday is their golfing day, or Sunday is their uh, day when they're watching all the football teams or whatever, and, or they right. have planned a picnic, and so there is malice of forethought. It isn't because they're trying to keep the day holy. It is that they are trying to uh, accommodate their own sinful desires uh, by doing it this way. Now, the fact is, uh, if we're a true believer, and let's 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 even... Uh, assume, which is, I don't believe is true at all, but let's assume that it was from sundown to sundown. We certainly are not going to say, well, then I'll do my worshiping on Saturday night and that'll free me up for Sunday uh, to do my own pleasure because that would still be an enormous violation. So uh, why anybody would even be interested in the question, I don't know, except on a very hypothetical or or academic uh, 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 position. Yeah, I'm just looking at it purely from a biblical calendar pr- position. Um, uh, or, well, but it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't. It doesn't tie into anything. It doesn't uh, doesn't relate. It uh, and and we have more evidence that it's from midnight to midnight and and. Uh, uh, and uh, there, that that creates no difficulties of any kind with the biblical calendar. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camping. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. All right. Can you uh, speak on a couple things um, in regards to Revelation and the end of the church age? Can you talk about um, the Church of Philadelphia seems to be in good standing at that point? Is there any scripture that talks about what happened with them? Well, we don't. We know what happened to them right, from, right. from our own history. Uh, in, a, in a few hundred years, none of these churches stood any longer. Okay. And what is happening? And and while the church at Philadelphia uh, apparently uh, had no uh, was was still more faithful than the other churches, we read less. 
about them. These things uh, saith he we read in Revelation 3, verse 7, uh, that he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man knoweth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. But it's not quite as good as all that. For, uh, all the way through. Look at verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say, that, that is the assembly of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved them, because thou hast kept, uh, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. In other words, there is already a warning. You have people in your congregation that are part of the assembly of Satan. And so Philadelphia doesn't come off scot-free either. None of the seven churches do. Okay. And also, you know, I heard some people say that Judas Iscariot was a friend and was loved of God. Can you talk about that? That Judas Iscariot was what? He was loved and a friend of God. He was loved by? Well, I, I, he was it, it only in the sense that he was part of the corporate body. You see, God speaks of his kingdom both in an external fashion and in an eternal fashion. Now, individually, those who are, are uh, elect of God, who are the true, who will become the true believers, they enjoy the love of God, and and those who are not elect, they are under the hatred of God. However, within the churches, as in the case of national Israel, God does use language that indicates he uh, he speaks of them as my people. Uh, those who are still uh, will never become saved are called my people. And he speaks uh, in Ezekiel 16, for example, he speaks of Israel and how he loved the, uh, Israel and, and, and did this for her and did that for her. And, and then they turned into a terrible harlot and so on. And, and so in a corporate, in a general sense, yes, Judas was under the love of God, but not, not in the sense of, of salvation, he was not under the love of God because he was the son of perdition. He was right. he was not one of God's elect. Okay, just two quick things, and I'll let you go. The skivas that were trying to cast out the spirit in the name of Jesus, the one that Paul preaches um, in Acts. Further down, it talks about where the people brought all their artwork and their books, and they burned them. And it's said to be a value of around fifty thousand pieces of silver. Is there any significance to the fifty thousand? I don't, I don't know. It's been too long since I've looked at that, and so I'd be speculating right at this moment. Can I make one comment about Romans 10? Because I know you get a lot of calls about that. Yeah. Uh, verse 8 and verse 14 gives them an idea of what has to happen, and then verse 17 kind of confirms it. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Romans 8? Romans what, 10, 8. Yeah, what, what saith it? Right. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith. That is, and faith here is, uh, when we read about salvation and the word faith, uh, one of the easiest way to understand what God is saying is substitute the word Christ, because Christ is the faithful one, right. and he is the one through whom we are saved. And so when we do that, and that's very legitimate because, uh, because Christ's name is faithful, and, and, he, and faith is a work that, all, and Christ did all the work to save us. And so thy word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of Christ which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and right. so on. And then verse 17 confirms it all. I'm sorry? And then verse 17 confirms it all. So then faith cometh by hearing, that is, Christ comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Word of God is also identified with right, Christ. Right. He's the Word. And so God is saying the whole work is Christ's work. Yeah. Well, so was Esau ever saved then, Mr. Campion? Because we know he knew of God and beseeched him, or petitioned him with tears. I'm sorry, repeat that, please. Um, Esau, we oh, know that he, he knew he, of God because he petitioned him with tears, So, but it's, he yeah. was not saved. Is that right? 
Yeah, well, now you see, the, uh, we, use, we in our language, we, we use the phrase uh, co- crocodile tears. That is, uh, we use that phrase flippantly to indicate those who, who, uh, who really appear to be all torn up and sorrowful and cheery are really it's just a sham. They're just putting on a front. Now, in Esau's case, from his vantage point, he was not just... It was not a sham. It was a, it was a true, uh, insofar as he was concerned, a true uh, pity, self-pity, sorrow. Oh, how terrible that I have uh, I've been deprived of the birthright and the blessing. Uh, but actually, it was only a self-pity. It was not, it was not pity because he had sinned, because he had, had, uh, had sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. In other words, he discounted its value tor- horribly. Uh, he uh, disdained it. In other words, he considered it as not important a bit, and which was a dreadful sin in itself. And so it, uh, it, uh, it was not the tears of a of a broken heart it was the tears of a man who has self great self pity for himself great hey, thank you mr camping thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our last call please good evening welcome to open forum hello yes hello hello brother camping yes go ahead with your call um i have a couple questions please um first one what does the Bible say about drinking is drinking not allowed. You're not supposed to drink. Um, would the words like being sober is that translated to be be sensible? Yeah, that has nothing to do with drinking or with alcoholism. It is in our language, of course, we say being sober is uh, being uh, not under the influence uh, because uh, as soon as you're under the influence you're not sensible at all you are you're you're potentially able to do any kind of a wild thing that you would you would never do if you had not been drinking but and actually in the bible it simply means wise it's really being careful in what you are doing and thank you for calling and sharing. I guess we have time for one more call. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Yes. I started listening to you back in February, March. I first I had called the local one in there. I called him and I said, he says, do you believe in Jesus? And I says, I don't know. And then he says, do you believe he died for your sins? And I said, I suppose he did. And then he says, well, don't worry, you're saved then. And I thought to myself, this guy don't have all the facts or something. <laughs> and then I got your radio station tuned in, and I was curious to call in when somebody had called what about the blacks and the whites and the yellows. And the first time you called in and you said, well, that region or something, and then afterwards, then the guy called in later, and he, you said, God only knows how that happened. So I think you got your line straight in this business. Well, uh, you know, uh, what we want to do on family radio is be as accurate as we possibly can in the Word of God. We don't ever want to... Uh, teach what appears reasonable or rational, but we want to teach only what God allows us to teach, and that requires very careful study and comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now, right now, I'm going to have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time program, our time for our program. And so, uh, until our next program, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.